Good morning, and thank you for joining us here at our service. We're here every Sunday at half past ten, and we're also here on a Tuesday at seven o'clock for our Bible study. God bless you. It's all the way. It's all the way. Savior leads me What have I To ask beside Can I doubt His tender mercy Who through life Has been my guide Heavenly peace Divinest comfort here by faith in him to dwell for I know whatever befalls me Jesus do it all things well and it's all the way song but really it's a time for you to bring your own personal devotions to the Lord so as we listen to these songs and we will be listening to them I would ask that you pray to God now it's been a long time since we've been in church a long time since we've fellowshiped and worshiped together some people are getting into out of the habit of praying, of worshipping, of serving God. But we don't have to. No, these these are, are challenging times, but they shouldn't be wasted times. 
Don't let them be wasted times. Let your life count. Let every day be a victory and worship God and let God speak to you. Hallelujah. In days of uncertainty, we need something which is certain and true and sure. We live in a very unstable world, a very uncertain world. We live dictated by the thoughts and ideas of men and women who have reached the high echelons of power and they believe that what they think and what they know is the way to pass on to other people. But you know, we are not of such a persuasion. We believe in the word of God. God has spoken. God has visited this planet. God turned up in Jesus Christ and has shown us the way to eternal life. And the way to eternal life is to return to our God and to do his bidding and to find his kingdom. So we're going to spend some time in the scripture uh, and we're going to continue in our study. Let's have a wee word of prayer, shall we? Father, bless us as we look at the Bible. Lord, help the Bible to become alive in our hands this morning. Lord, we pray that the He, the Holy Spirit of God, who breathed these words that were penned and printed and passed on to us, that He Himself will be present amongst us to take up these words and to imprint them once again into the depths of our hearts and minds that we might leave this place with food for our souls, knowing that we have heard from God. We pray this in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, and for his glory alone. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, welcome to our service. If you're visiting for the first time, you're very, very welcome. We do have a children's kids zone on at the moment, but we can tell you about that later, if, you, if you're coming back some other time, and the children want to enjoy the kids zone. Praise God. Now what we've been doing in our studies in uh, the morning services, although last week I kind of reversed the proceedings, last week I preached the evening service in the morning, and I preached the morning service in the evening. So you people who don't come at night, if you want to hear what you should have heard last week, you'll have to go to the internet now and track it down. It's on the website, you can track down what we were talking about last week. And what we were doing, and what we have been doing for a long, long time now, is going into every single book in the Bible. And the Bible is a very special book. It has got the fingerprint of God in every page. It could not possibly have been written by humans because there is the stamp of God everywhere. And one of the things that binds the whole Bible together, the thread that runs through it, which is showing us that there's a God in heaven who's trying to speak to a lost humanity, is that the salvation plan is in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, right through the thousands of years Right through to the end of the New Testament, there is one link, and that link is the person of the Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we have looked at him in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, on and on and on, right through to Malachi. We looked through every book of the Old Testament, and we found Jesus Christ was present in that book. And then we, 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 we crossed the sound barrier, as it were. And we moved into the New Testament where the fulfillment of the promises of God were recorded when Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He lived and he died. He was buried and he rose again and he ascended to the Father and then he ascended the Holy Spirit to empower his people to declare the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ that salvation is available, that sins can be forgiven, that God is reconciling men and that they can come back to himself. So last week we looked at the Gospel of Luke. I say if you missed it because we preached it in the evening. And you don't come to the evening service. You will get it on the website. Go to the website and just click on recent listening. Whatever the icon is. And you can track it down. Now we're going to look then at the Gospel of John. We're in the Gospel of John this morning. We'll spend some time. A few minutes in the Gospel of John. Uh, looking at Jesus Christ as he is represented in the Gospel of John. Now, if you've been listening closely to the studies of Matthew, Mark and Luke, these are known as what they call the Synoptic Gospels. There are three Gospels which tell much the same story, but from different standpoints. It's a bit like being a witness at a car accident, 
One guy was standing in one corner, one guy was standing in the other corner, one guy was standing at the back. And the policeman comes along and says, what did you see? What happened here? And they all tell what they saw from where they were standing. And Matthew, he was standing there as a Jew, and he tells it from, tells it from a Jewish perspective. Mark, which is the first gospel that was ever written, it's a very fast-moving gospel, he tells it from a different standpoint. And last week we talked about Luke, who talked about it from the point of view of the Gentiles, people who were not Jews. But we now come to the Gospel of John, the fourth gospel. The fourth gospel. Praise God for the fourth gospel. It's totally unique, totally different from the other three gospels. And it presents the divine Jesus Christ. The divine Jesus Christ. You know, there is no recording in the book of John about Jesus being born. You get that in Matthew, you get that in Luke. You tell the Christmas story, how Jesus was born. But you get to the Gospel of John. John doesn't do that. He goes further back than that. He goes back to an understanding of what was born. What was born. Because you see, John was a very mystical person, a very spiritual person. He got to know Jesus Christ in a very intimate way. He was. Uh, some people believe it might have been John the Elder that wrote this book, uh, or, or John the son of Zebedee, you know, James and John, the disciple. But we know he was a disciple whom Jesus loved. And we know that he had a very, very revealed understanding of Jesus Christ. It took the disciples a long time to understand who they were dealing with. Many of the disciples thought that Jesus Christ was an earthly king. He was going to use his wonderful powers to restore the kingdom of Israel and to vanquish the Romans who had occupied their land beyond the seas again and that he would reinstate the kingdom on earth. But the Bible says, the kingdom is amongst you. Where Jesus is, it's heaven there. Jesus is the kingdom. And we need to understand this. John, he got to understand that Jesus Christ was, is in fact God in the flesh. God in the flesh. So let's look up a wee scripture from the Gospel of John. And this is the last chapter of John. John tells us his introduction to his book at the end of his book. You've got to go to the end to go forward, if you were. In the last chapter of John, he tells us his summary, what he is writing. John chapter 20, verse 30, 31 says... Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He tells us what he's doing. He says, I have been selective. Jesus did lots of signs. He doesn't call them miracles, he calls them signs. Because to many people, miracles were just power. Power that made you special. But when John began to understand, these were not just miracles to say this man has power. These were signs to tell you who this man is. He is different. He is the son of God. And so at the end of the book, he tells us why he wrote it. And he tells us that Jesus did lots of things. He calls them signs. And they're not recorded in this book. In fact, he says that if everything was recorded, the whole world could not contain what he did. Such was the great mighty power he received the Spirit without measure. He did amazing things to Jesus Christ. But he gives us in his book seven signs, seven miracles. He seems to love the number seven. The number seven, by the way, if you're into numbers in the Bible, you always find it talks about completion. Six seems to be the number of man. And seven seems to be the number of God. All things done well, the seven. And not only does he give us seven signs, he gives us seven titles for Jesus Christ. So he writes in a very distinct way to present to the church who Jesus Christ is and how we know he is who he says he is. He's the Messiah. What is the Messiah? Well, the word Messiah is a Hebrew word which means the one in whom God has put his anointing, the special one that was prophesied of in all these books of the Bibles that we mentioned earlier on. He'd come, and he was Jesus Christ. You know, John the Baptist didn't realize that Jesus Christ was the Messiah until the Holy Spirit fell on him. You can read it in John's Gospel. 
John's Gospel tells us that the, the Lord who sent John the Baptist out to baptize in the wilderness had said to him, Him on whom you see the Spirit descending, he is the one. He did not know. He did not know that Jesus was a Christ until when Jesus came forward to be baptized in the Jordan River, the Holy Spirit came down upon him. Then John the Baptist knew that this indeed was a Messiah. Because the sign was fulfilled. The signs were given. Signs are given to us that we might come to Christ. He's a Messiah. He's the Son of God. Now what does that mean, the Son of God? How does God have a son? Is he married? Does he have children? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that the Son is someone who issues out from the Father. He's eternally begotten. He is from the Father. He is of fullness with the Father. And he is God. Eternally begotten. He is the Son of God. And he is forever God. And that by believing you might have life in his name. And that's what we're talking about in church this morning. If you're not seeing people converted, there's something wrong. We tell people these, these things from the gospel that they might believe and have life. That they might escape death. And that's why we tell people... And the very last part of John's Gospel says, this is why you've got the story. That by believing you might have life in his name. Whose name do we get life in? Jesus' Jesus's name. The one who is the Messiah. The one who is the Son of God. There is no life in any other. There are many false religions in this world. And I've heard people say to me, you know, there are many roads to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, broad is the path that leads to destruction, and many there be that go therein. But narrow is the path that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Jesus says, one of his titles, I am the way, the truth, and the life. One of the great I am sayings in Jesus says, in John's Gospel that Jesus states. So you see, that's why it's written, that you might have life in the name of Jesus, that you might trust in the name of Jesus, and you might tell others that this is God's way. Praise God. So let's have a wee look at it. We'll leave that verse up to keep us in remembrance. But when we open up the book of John, we, we read, as I mentioned, he doesn't give us the story of Jesus' birth. But what he does say, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. He goes back to the origin beyond this world. And he sees in Jesus Christ the fullness of God dwelling bodily. John talks about Jesus Christ bringing grace, but grace upon grace, grace upon grace. What came into this world when Jesus Christ came was something who was pre-existed. He was the Son of God made flesh amongst us. And he came bearing the fullness that we might find God. I don't think these people realise who stood on the shores of Galilee. That the one who flew, who threw the stars into space... You know, the astronomers are discovering phenomenal things in other galaxies. Jesus Christ put them there. Jesus Christ put them there. And he stood amongst us. The great God of all creation. I remember as a young Christian having some wonderful experiences with Jesus Christ. Having real deep experiences with God. And what happened was in the depths of my soul. I would feel this feeling. How is it? And nothing like me. A God who created the whole of the universe is speaking to me and showing me something. How has he got time for me? Who knows the bounds of the love of God? Grace upon grace upon grace. Now I don't think we're going to get through this message this morning. I just get that feeling. It's coming over me. But I think what we'll do is we'll look at the seven titles of Jesus and maybe uh, next week we'll look at the seven the seven uh, signs that Jesus gave in the, in the book of John. Well, the first title was the Lamb of God. I mentioned John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was baptizing in the Jordan River. You read it for yourself. People came to him and said, Who are you? Are you that prophet? He said, Are you Elijah? He says, No. He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare you the way of the Lord. And when he saw Jesus Christ coming... Now he knew who he was when the Holy Spirit descended on him. He looked on him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God. Now the Lamb of God is a title which takes us back to sacrificial offerings. 
The sacrificial offering. Because the Jewish people who had received instruction from God knew that sin was sin. Sin is not something that God winks at. Sin requires blood. Because Adam was told, the day you sin, you'll die. You know, we live in a world that people think sin is fun. They think sin, so what? We all do it. Everybody's going to hell then. Because the consequences of sin is death, and that is an eternal death. And the Jews were told to cover their sins with the blood of an animal. that required death. That's how serious sin is. And they would offer up sacrifices and they would give them on the altar in the temple. And that blood would be for a year. And then the next year they would do it again. They would try to transfer their sin into an offering. And they would use a lamb. But you see when we broke bread this morning and we drank that cup. We were remembering the lamb of God. There was one sacrifice. Which was for time and eternity. And that is the sacrifice of the lamb of God who is Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? He died on that cross, the blood being shed, and he told his disciples before it happened that it would happen, because he said, the Son of Man has come to give his life a ransom for many. He gave his life blood, he allowed his body to be broken, to pay a debt that we could not pay, to, that, that we owed it, and he could pay it, because he was the sinless Lamb of God. He was the only one who never sinned. He walked in the complete... Fulfillment of his father's will. And he did his father's will all the way to the cross. So we read that in John. John 1.34. John the Baptist bears witness that Jesus is the son of God. And in John 11.27. We read something else. That Martha calls him Messiah. And the son of God. Praise God. That's the next title. He's the lamb of God. And John the Baptist also said he was the son of God. And so we read of him as the Son of God, and we also read of him as the Son of Man. Let me see what it says in chapter 5, verse 24. Very truly I tell you, ever, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. So we have this Son of God, which is clearly stated eh, that he's the Lamb of God, he's the Son of God, he came from God, but also he has authority in dealing with the issues concerning every single one of us here because he is the Son of Man. He became completely man. He is completely God, but he came completely man, born and clothed in human flesh. He walked amongst us. He suffered what we suffered. There's no temptation taken us, but such is common to man. But God is able to deliver us because he also has been tested. And praise God, came out victorious. Hallelujah. And then at the end of the age, authority is given to him to judge because he is the son of man. Hallelujah, the Son of God and the Son of Man. And he's also the Messiah. We read in, uh, in, in John's Gospel about the woman at the well, you know the story, she was a Samaritan. The Samaritans had no dealings with the Jews, and Jesus rested at this well. The disciples went to get food. And while they were away, this woman came, and Jesus asked her to give me some drink, and she said, you have nothing to draw with. He said, Jesus said to her, if you knew who you were talking to, if you knew who you were talking to, she said, I would give you water. It would dwell up, rise up from your deep, deep innermost being. Waters of life. And then he says to her, and he tells her his life story. He tells her about the sinful condition she was living in. She'd had seven husbands and the man she was living with was not her husband. And this woman was amazed. How do you know these things? And the reason he knew was because out of her own admission he said when the Messiah comes he will show us all things. They had a wee dispute about where they should worship whether it should be in that mountain in Samaria or whether it should be in Jerusalem. And Jesus reveals that he was the Messiah the sent one of God. And this woman rushes away to tell others to come and see the one who has told them all everything that she 
has ever done is this not the Messiah this is God's man God's man is amongst them we read that at the women at the well we also read in John chapter 3 about a rabbi called Nicodemus coming to visit Jesus and he calls Jesus rabbi so not only is the Lamb of God the Son of God the Son of Man the Messiah he's also on a human level a rabbi he's a teacher and Nicodemus came to have a heart to heart conversation with Jesus at night one rabbi to another but he discovered that Jesus' teaching went to the very heart of his soul for Nicodemus said to him we know you're a teacher come from God going back to the signs for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with you we know you're from God because the miracles are happening he says but Jesus looked at him he said verily I say to you except a man be born again he'll not see the kingdom of God God spoke to the man's heart and the man's heart was saying what is it you know that we don't know? We're the learned people of the land. But you know something. And Jesus says to him, Except you be born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. He says, How can a man be born again? Can he go back inside his mother? He says, Can he be born as a baby all over again? Jesus said, That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. One thing you'll learn about John's Gospel, it's talking about the spiritual world. You need to have a spiritual rebirth. You need to be born of God if you want to go to heaven. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You need the Holy Spirit to come, and to come into your being, and to cleanse you and purge you, and to give you the Holy Spirit of God to give you new life. That you might be accepted to God. And this is the, the rabbi, Jesus the rabbi, teaching. Now we're, we're running out of time. But I'll just mention the two others and we'll carry on with this next week. But the other two titles are the king of Israel. You know the story in John's gospel, that wonderful story where Lazarus is raised from the dead. And after that, Jesus enters Jerusalem. A place where his life was at risk. And as he enters on Palm Sunday, he enters as a king, riding on the colt of a donkey. And the palms are cast down, the palm leaves, and the, the people put their coats on the floor saying, Hosanna, the son of David, Hosanna, the king. And he's the king of Israel. We know that he's the king of Israel. And the last title is Jesus of Nazareth. We'll mention a wee bit more about that next week. But you know the Bible talks about one of the people said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And you know when the people came to arrest Jesus, they were working on a human earthly level, thinking they were just arresting another prisoner. And Judas, who had betrayed Jesus, he took him to Jesus and the, the, the question they asked him was, not are you Jesus the Lamb of God? Not are you Jesus the Messiah? Not are you Jesus the Son of Man? Not are you Jesus the Son of God? Not are you Jesus the King of Israel? Are you Jesus of Nazareth? And I'll tell you Christians, people will try to do that to you. They'll try to bring your faith down to the, to the earthly level. Are you Jesus of Nazareth? And Jesus stood up and said, I am. But he, when he said, I am, he said the name of God, and all fell on their faces. He is Jesus of Nazareth. Praise God. So here we have it. We've looked a wee bit at the Gospel of John. His love of sevens, just to make his argument, that Jesus is seven things that he clears to be. We need to know who Jesus is. If you want to go to heaven, you need to know who Jesus is. If you're a Christian, you need to learn who Jesus is. And we need to grow in knowledge of who Jesus is. Not all about him, but knowing him. It's relationship, relationship, relationship. Getting to know Jesus and all the facets of what he is, is what it's all about. It's what it's all about. How do you know Jesus this morning? Is he a distant image in your mind? Or do you have a, if you had experience of Jesus Christ as a king? I was reading a Facebook comment with a minister. And he was referring to God, somebody had been ill, and somebody says, Oh, I hope you're all right. He says, oh, I'm just trusting in the big man. The big man. He was referring to God. And I thought, what is his relationship that he brings it down to such a level? What is your relationship? What level are you at? When you enter into Christ's presence, do you enter into fearsome holiness? Do you fear God? Or is Jesus your pal? 
Jesus, your pal. That's not how John found him. You get to the revelation of John, you'll find another dimension. You're dealing with the divine. You're dealing with the divine. And when you read John's gospel, you're not dealing with an earthly man. You are, because in all ways he was flesh, but you're dealing with the divine. Oh, that we would catch the vision and stop living in this earth. Stop living the way that men live and live above it through the power that God has given. Let's live above it. If you're not a Christian this morning, you can become a Christian by knowing Jesus Christ, by being born again. Now we'll carry on with this next week. Time is overtaking us. Praise God for the Gospel of John. When I get converted, I used to talk to people, lead them to the Lord, and I used to say to them, read your Bible. Don't start at Genesis. Start at the book of John. And somebody said to me, you know, no, no, you should tell them to start at the book of Mark. John is too, too deep. I said, listen, the Gospel of John is so shallow. I read this in a commentary. A child could paddle in it. At the same time, it's so deep, an elephant could swim in it. The Gospel of John is fantastic when you read it for the first time. And the hundredth time later, when you're still reading it, you're going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Such is the working of the Holy Spirit in giving us the Gospel of John. Read it and let it speak to you. Lord, bless this word to us. Help us, Lord, to know Jesus Christ as John knew him. He who was called to a great ministry for your glory and in his name.
the Lord be with us in this coming week. In Jesus' name, amen.